lovely. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing great. It's so lovely to see the chat livening up already. It's so wicked to have you here. Thank you all for taking the time. I can see from Macfield, Woking, Norwich, Teesside, uh, Hamilton, which presumably will be uh, in, in Canada, Ontario, potentially. Um, I am seeing lots of messages, however. Coming... Uh, Hamilton, Ontario is actually the home of the first ever Tim Hortons. I've been there. Yep, it so, yeah. It was uh, it was around the corner from my house. I lived there for a year. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, great place. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I can see a lot of messages coming into panelists only. So make sure when you are in that chat feature to just switch the little the little thing down the bottom, the little blue thing, uh, from two panelists to two panelists and attendees, and then everyone can see your messages. So uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you all so so much for being here. Um, I'm going to make my introduction nice and brief today because we're all just like really, really excited to have Rory here uh, today. Uh, and so I'm going to keep it brief, as I say, but I want to highlight three main points that I think will make today a success. So the first is that the content gives you something that you didn't know or will help you think about something a little bit different. If you do that, then you move the, the, the needle 1%. That's an amazing thing. That's a, an outstanding thing to happen from an hour invested in yourself. Uh, the second thing is that the chat feature stays alive as it is right now. So we've got Mark, who's just said morning from Helsinki and uh, Gavin from South Africa, which is amazing. So like keep that chat feature alive, because really today is a team effort. Um, Rory's super au fait with with the Zoom sort of like UI as much as anything else. So he'll be able to see your chat messages coming through um, as well as your questions, which can go in the Q&A section. Uh, so please do take the time to, uh, to contribute to today's, se to today's session by keeping that chat feature going and going and going and going. Uh, the marketing meetup community really are a special bunch and it's really important that you take the time to meet each other. And then finally, see you, the third metric, the third metric that's going to make today a great session is that you share today's session. So whether it's on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever it may be, our community grows when people share it. So please do take the time just to let other people know that there's this amazing, use, useful resource for people out there. So if you're up for a challenge on those three points, let's go get going with today's session. And today we have the absolute pleasure of welcoming Rory Sutherland, the Vice Chairman of Ogilvy. Rory started in 1988 as a graduate copywriter and has since risen through the ranks uh, to the role of Vice Chairman. I think this is a title that is quite purposefully vague, but it gives Rory the freedom to explore advertising as well as look to elevate the industry, which he has done so, so well over the years. Uh, through his many speaking opportunities, but also through his book, Alchemy, which, by the way, uh, even though it's not gold like the hardcover, the, the, the paperback version has been released uh, last month, I think it was, Rory. That's it, yeah. Lovely, and, and it's well worth reading. I've actually got the audio book, and you can get Rory in your ears for hours and hours and hours if you want it, and it's definitely worth it. Um, so, Rory, thank you so much for being here, my friend. The last thing I need to do uh, is to thank our sponsors for today. Uh, and every week we have a featured sponsor and this week it's Cambridge Marketing College. Um, there's very little I need to say about Cambridge Marketing College, except they're lovely, lovely human beings. And if you want marketing qualifications, they're the people to go to. I think I can almost leave it at that. They've been unbelievable supporters of the marketing meetup throughout the course of time. Um, I also want to thank the other sponsors very quickly. So a big, big thank you to Pitch, Content Cal, Fiverr, Redgate, Lead, uh, Geosk, Brand, Further, Third Light, and Human, uh, and Impression. Um, a big, big thank you to them. If it wasn't for them, uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we do every week. So uh, that's me done. Uh, so Rory, welcome. And the stage is yours, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. So, Joy, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I'll start just by saying the reason I created a behavioural science practice uh, within Ogilvy uh, was really for two reasons. I was just going to explain it very simply. First of all, I thought there was a whole area of marketing inquiry, uh, which I thought was missing. Now, I started affecting my entire working life. I joined as a graduate trainee 
uh, what was then called Ogilvy and Mather Direct uh, in 1988. And the ultimate boss of Ogilvy and Mather Direct then in, in the UK was the great Drayton Bird. Now, I don't know if he's ever been on the show, but if he hasn't, you should emphatically invite him on because I think he's my kind of Svengali and still is. He's one of the sort of five people who's been a huge influence on my life. And what was fabulous about direct marketing and still is, and this is why David Ogilvy always said that any copywriter should spend four years in direct marketing before they start working in general advertising, is you find out what works. And generally, not necessarily intentionally, sometimes it's accidental, and I'll come to this later, quite a lot of progress is in fact accidental. I mean, the whole of evolution is kind of accidental. There's no plan, okay? It's simply a feedback mechanism that works. You discover things accidentally or intentionally, uh, which are spectacularly valuable, but which are also quite often slightly, at first glance, slightly nonsensical or unexpected. And probably the deciding thing that got me interested in behavioral economics and behavioral science was a very strange thing that happened quite early in my working life. I suppose it would have been about 1990, 91, where we were selling products for BT, which is, you probably remember, um, they were called star services. They still exist, in fact. They're now called network services. And they're things like the wake-up call on your phone. They use the star or the hash keys, typically, on a, on a touchtone on touchstone landline and it might be call diversion call waiting which is still obviously something you're familiar with um uh three-way calling or reminder calls things like that and you could buy the right to use those for about it was something like i think it was about you know a couple of pounds a month typically it might have been 199 a month back in 1990. And the way we used to do this, because it was 1990, was we used to write typically to the customers who had larger phone bills. And um, uh, by which, by the way, there is a separate story I can tell you, which is um, uh, top res, in other words, BT's top residential customers, um, uh, were uh, the category we chose. And it was people who back then had a quarterly phone bill, uh, you know, around about £100 or more. It was, you know, significantly higher than the average and if you've ever heard a rumour in direct marketing that a letter went out to a certain number of people addressed, dear rich bastard, uh, this is actually true. Uh, I, can, I can confess now after 30 years, which is that a company that did the lasering for us needed a default salutation. And typically the default salutation, this is old direct marketing law, you'd put dear customer or dear reader um, or, uh, you know, dear sir or madam, if you're being particularly formal. But it was the salutation you used if you didn't know someone's title. And so, you, did, you, know, you know, back then in 1990, you didn't just say dear Rory. And so if you didn't know whether I was Mr, Mrs or Ms, you put the default salutation. And some guy at the lasering company didn't know what the default salutation was. So put in as a placeholder, because these were wealthier customers, dear rich bastard. <laughs> And in the end, about 25 of them went out um, and um, we had to set up a special division to phone them up and kind of apologise. Um, luckily, it never got into the sun. And I know why, because someone sitting next to me at the desk in 1990 uh, received a phone call from his mate, who was a journalist on the sun, who said, um, you work with BT, do you on, uh, you know, on the direct marketing? He said, yes. He said, yeah, because I've just had a guy contact me saying he's just received a letter from BT address to dear rich bastard. And um, he said, since it's you, I won't put it in the paper. <laughs> so we escaped major opprobrium through this extraordinarily fluky coincidence. But I partly tell that story because it shows how much luck and weird randomness uh, plays a role in life. But anyway, one of the clients, we used to send letters, and the letters inviting people to actually sign up to, um, uh, let's say, call, call waiting, okay, uh, would have an 0800 number on the letter, and then the bottom of the letter would just have a little pre-lasered form with their name and address or, and their customer account number already filled in, and they could tick a box saying, yes, I'd like to uh, take up BT call diversion or call waiting, and they'd put it in a prepaid envelope and then post it back. And typically, more people used to post their replies than used to phone up. And 
Uh, what happened actually was the client was slightly nuts, to be absolutely honest. And he had he took against the fact that every time we received a postal response, we were giving money to the post office, which was, of course, a recently separated from BT, the telephone company, and seen by them as a competitor. I don't think anybody thinks of the telephone and the post as competitors. But back in 1990, you sort of did. See. And he said, well, we're trying to inculcate a phone culture in the UK, and I don't understand why we're giving all this money to the post office every month whenever we do a mailing. So um, I just want to have the phone number and no, no postal response. And we said, which was the responsible thing, well, I think we should test this before we do it. And so, funnily enough, we did quite an elaborate test where we had three cells, 50,000 people chosen at random. Because direct marketing is basically social science experiments or behavioral economics experiments performed at someone else's expense at enormous scale. You know, we never really realized this. And strangely, behavioral economists didn't really realize this. I don't think people in behavioral science ever thought, well, before we do our experiments with 200 Princeton students, why don't we go and see what the direct marketing industry has to tell us about this stuff? But anyway, we were two industries who were two organisations and lines of inquiry who were completely unaware of each other's existence back then. So anyway, 50,000 people got post only, 50,000 people got phone only, and 50,000 people got a choice of two. You could phone or you could post. And fascinatingly, um, uh, you know, the results came in, and I wish I had the very exact results, but I can remember them to within about 0.1 of a percent. Typically, um, uh, what happened was when you offered people this product and the price was exactly the same, the product description was exactly the same, nothing else was different uh, apart from the mode of response. Phone only uh, had a response rate of about 2%. Uh, post only had a response rate of, I think this is right, of 6%. And when you offered people the choice, the response rate was near as, damn it, 8%. And we looked at this and we said, well, first of all, we don't think it's a good idea making it phone only because you're throwing away, uh, you know, the great majority of your potential respondents. But we had this even weirder finding, which is that the biggest determinant of whether you bought the product wasn't what it was or how much it cost. It was how you could order it, the mode of response. And my only suggestion when I looked at the data is, well, next time we do a mailing, we ought to offer fax response because there wasn't any internet back then. We ought to offer fax response because we'll probably get another half a percent that way. And <coughs> to an economist, these figures are completely baffling. you see. OK, economists aren't completely stupid. They understand their things called transaction costs. And if you have a relative preference for using the phone or using the post, you know, there will be a certain amount of friction added. But this fact that giving people a choice, basically, you know, the, the mode of response is the biggest determinant on whether you reply is really, really interesting. And we have very, we still don't fully know why it is. Is it because effectively, one theory is that by giving people a choice, Instead of thinking, do I want this product or not? They start thinking, shall I pick up the phone or shall I pick up a pen? And it changes their mental state from thinking about how to reply rather than thinking about um, uh, how to, um, uh, you know, whether to buy the product or not. Another response is simply that um, the, the actual hassle required in the response according to the moment is an extraordinarily strong determinant of whether people reply. But I, 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 lots of people have been saying, you know, I, I, I really, really miss um, direct marketing. And I agree. And one of the things I've noticed, by the way, is that the central lesson from that, which is that give people a choice of response channels. In the mail order industry, one of the lessons is, you, you know, you allow people to order in, in as many ways as they possibly can and you put a phone number on every single page. You know, in other words, you give people as many opportunities as is feasible for them to get in touch with you and enact and buy. And one thing that does worry me, by the way, is we've now basically assumed that everything's gonna happen on the internet. And that bothers me quite a lot. And it's partly driven just by cost savings and it's partly driven by just a, an idea that that's where the future's headed. And it worries me quite a bit because 
For example, post-pandemic, we're going to see things like telemedicine becoming more and more common. And the way I would always propose doing this is that if, if you can save a lot of money by allowing people to see their GP over Zoom for routine inquiries, okay, you should actually compensate and make some other GP's visits 10 minutes longer or more, or, you know, if, if for example, a middle-aged male who hasn't been, males go to the doctor much more reluctantly than females do in general, okay, I'm not, that's not a universal rule. Um, if he goes to the doctor for the first time in six years, you should probably have 10 minutes to spare for an extra checkup, okay, or just asking a few probing questions. And the trouble is that the finance people and the procurement people get involved, and you end up doing everything the cheaper way and, th and then banking the money instead of saying, actually, the way customer service should have gone with the internet, the way customer service should have gone, if you care about a brand and a reputation and you care about your customer's long-term satisfaction and lifetime value, credit card companies should have said, that's great, okay? Uh, we don't have to pay people a salary to answer banal questions like, what's my balance, okay? We don't have to deal with a phone call every time someone wants to query a bill or look at a, you know, look at a statement. But equally, we shouldn't have taken all those money as savings because we should have said, well, what that means is that the questions we're going to get on the phone are now going to be more complicated and we should actually invest more in having more expert, more experienced people answering the phone calls. Now, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't save money, but the extent to which shifting things towards digital channels has been often done exclusively to save money without asking what is the correct trade-off, what's the correct calibration between human and technical and technological modes of interaction strikes me as a real mistake. And I, I, I can see it happening in medicine just as it happened in you know, credit card um, customer service that the finance function takes over. Now, the finance function has a kind of, along with procurement, has a kind of sacred position in business because basically it has the right of veto over everything that costs money. And as a result, businesses tend to give a right of, a right of veto to the finance function, um, which is, when, when you think about it, the most risk-averse part of a business. And... The problem with people, with organizations like the finance function and procurement, which we haven't noticed, okay, is if you work in finance, you can claim all the credit for cost savings, but you never get blamed for missed opportunities. And so finance and procurement are actually slightly dodgily asymmetric decision making entities because you can kill things. You can take the short term credit for the short term cost saving that you've now obtained through the cost saving. But when six months, 18 months down the line, things start going wrong, you start losing customers because the people dealing with the call center queries aren't as good or because no one's answering the phone. It isn't finance who gets blamed for it. And so I think we've got to be very cautious about this because we give extraordinary power to anybody who has. And, and by the way, with that group of people, I'd include management consultants. We've given this group of people the power to go in, to reshape things in a way that saves money in the short term, to take the credit exclusively for those savings, to dump the problems on other departments. And then when things go wrong as a result of those false economies, those people are no longer in the frame. So what my friend Nassim Taleb would say is we've created a finance department in a way with no skin in the game. And so one of the things that finance tends to kill is testing. So I'll get back to my original point. I promise I will maintain this on a, on a reasonable theme. OK, so the reason I, I, I got into behavioral science was partly that uh, it was partly the fact that um, uh, I realized there were loads and loads of huge things going on, some of which we knew about, but a lot of which we didn't, which didn't make much obvious sense, which weren't intuitively obvious, but which had a huge effect on whether you sold or whether you didn't, and on how people reacted emotionally to what was at a rational level, you know, a fairly straightforward proposition, you would get an inordinately different emotional reaction according to tiny details in terms of presentation, framing, uh, description. And so when I discovered behavioral economics, I finally thought, finally, there's a science that understands this because I was convinced that in the advertising industry and in marketing in general, we were too focused on 
two equally very important things, pure creative and pure targeting. And we weren't paying enough attention to what you might call the rest of the five Ps. You know, we're obsessed with the promotional Marcoms element of marketing, but there were huge questions which deserved much greater inquiry, imagination and experimentation, which weren't even getting asked. So that was my first reason for creating a behavioral science practice, which last year, I'm proud to say, under the pandemic was the fastest growing bit within Ogilvy uh, from a fairly small base, I have to admit. And it, the small base is inevitable because... Uh, clients generally don't have a budget for problems they didn't know they had. And so the, the problem of running a behavioral science practice is your clients will have an advertising budget, and they'll have a direct marketing budget, and they'll have a, you know, uh, a search budget and a, you know, a, a, and a performance marketing budget, but nobody's actually got a behavioral science budget yet. So you have to win everything from scratch. Um, the other bit of good news, which I discovered as a byproduct of this, was that you weren't confined to working to with clients who had a huge marketing, a, a huge media budget. Now, the ad industry should have noticed this earlier because we haven't been paid on commission since about 1989, 1990. But our muscle memory is such that we still tend to gravitate to clients who have Marcoms budgets rather than marketing problems. And so in many cases, you know, those are extraordinarily interesting and important companies, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Reckitt, Benkiser, you know, they're a bre you know, brewery, beer companies, Diageo, fantastic companies. But for every company like that, there's a company that has marketing problems that need creative solutions, which doesn't have a big media budget. And not necessarily a company, it could be an organization. So one of the clients I'm proudest to work with with the behavioral science practice is the Thames Valley Police because you have extraordinary issues which are highly psychological and really, really deserving of experimentation and imaginative solutions. And I always thought that the, the, the marketing services industry was so busy cozying up to people who had media budgets that people who had bigger problems but didn't have media, you don't really need a big media budget if you're a police force. I mean, you can arrest people, right? You know, if you can detain people, uh, you don't really need to use, you know, poster campaigns to the same extent as, you, you know, if Unilever had the right of detention, I'm sure they'd advertise quite a lot that, okay? But it strikes me that there are areas there in the third, obviously in the charitable sector, there are areas in government which don't have big media um, budgets and therefore tend not to deploy much uh, sort of creative marketing thought. And by the way, it also applies to divisions within companies. So fascinatingly, if you look within companies, um, uh, quite often, uh, you know, OK, you've got the marketing department, but equally there are people in operations who need creative solutions. You know, there are people in other parts of the business um, who actually need, um, or what I always say when I talk to people like Unilever and Reckitt's, your trade marketing budgets are actually bigger than your consumer marketing budgets. And yet the amount of imagination and experimentation you put into spending them is about 1% of the imagination and experimentation and research you put into consumer marketing. And, um, uh, uh, this is very interesting. My bank used to give 24-7 customer support and I needed to contact them. Uh, the bank's excuse was they put that notification on the website. Um, but in a, you're absolutely right. In a distressed situation, you're going to phone. And this is, a, again, a complete failure to understand uh, that different human, you know, different human beings. It's like the AA saying, go to our website, isn't it? Right. Or the RAC. There are certain situations where you're always going to phone because it's urgent and you want instant feedback that your problem's been dealt with. And a very intelligent person I dealt with, was the guy, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the guy who founded it. We were talking about the need to optimize online conversion. And I won't quote the exact figures for reasons of, uh, of uh, confidentiality, but the guy who runs Mr. and Mrs. Smith, a uh, wonderful guy, James Lorne. And we were all talking about blah, 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 need to maximize online conversion. And he was at the back of the room because it's, it's a phrase. And he was at the back of the room and he said, just be careful about this because he said, um, visitors to our website convert at, and I'm going to make this figure up, but the, the ratios are roughly that right, okay? You know, 0. 0.x percent. Whereas people who phone us up convert at 23%. Now, 
facts. Those aren't the real figures. But the point I'm making is that he said, no, no, obviously, they're not like for like comparisons, right? Because people who phone are obviously much closer to the point of purchase than people who browse. But nonetheless, his point was this business of actually hiding your phone number on the website uh, is probably a false economy because you save a bit of money on your call center. But if the resulting effect is that you end up with half the number of customers, it's a high margin hotel business. OK, so actually the cost of a phone call is relatively nugatory in relation to the value of a high value sale. So attempting to cut those kind of costs in a high margin business could be an absolutely catastrophic mistake. And um, so, you know, that's one of the things that really worries me, that everybody starts, and funnily enough, one of my biggest and proudest moments, and I can't tell you what it's about because it's a secret project, but one of my proudest moments of media neutrality was recommending to Google that they launch a product through direct mail and having Google admit that I might be right, okay? Because direct mail says things that you can't say in digital, partly because it's expensive. It says we paid for a stamp, okay? So if you want to say a product's exclusive or you've been chosen to be part of a small group of people, okay, you can't do that on TV. And it's not really plausible on a spam email or on a piece of performance marketing because, you you know, but actually, if you say, you know, you are one of 20,000 people to receive this invitation, direct mail is the way to say it. If you want to invite people to join an exclusive club, direct mail is still probably the best way to do it. And we miss this. We absolutely miss this stuff. And we should still be testing it, okay? We should still be testing it. Instead, we've got into this crazy futurism where we go, the future's all about digital. And hiding phone numbers is one of the maddest things, by the way, I think people do. Um, what you should do is if someone's obviously been looking in the help section for more than three pages, a goddamn phone number should appear, you know, at the very least. Maybe make them go through a tiny bit of effort online to check that their question isn't totally banal i get that this isn't you know but actually the extent to which that kind of thing gets buried is absolutely abominable so that's the second big benefit with the behavioral science practice is you can work with organizations which or parts of organizations which don't necessarily have a big amount of money to spend on media but still need creative problem solving with human insight involved and um, by the way, this assumption thing that we make where things become a kind of collective insanity. Uh, if you go to the Nudgestock talks, it's on the Ogilvy Consulting YouTube site. There's a wonderful talk there by a guy called Guru Madhavan, who's actually a complexity systems engineer in Washington, D.C. And he's a kind of, you know, uber scientist. And he said the problem that happens with all these models is and it's the four T's, always bear this in mind, okay? You develop a model or a theory, like the future is all about the internet, okay, is one example. Or for example, um, uh, many economic models, you know, the, the model of the labor market or the model of the property market, okay, or whatever. And he said, they start out as a toy, then they become a theory, then they become a tradition, and then they become a trap. And eventually they start off with, this would be a useful aid to thinking if we pretended this. And then they start becoming a theory. Our theory is that this is true because of this. And then they become a tradition, which is the phrase gets used in business phrases like economies of scale, okay, get used. And they just become universal truths, which because there's a phrase for it, you don't need to say, well, are you sure there's an economy of scale in this case? Because people just go to economies of scale and the words, yes, that's right. You know, and there are loads of business mergers that fail just because everybody believes in business that if you make something bigger, you somehow make it more efficient. And they also believe, of course, that if you make something more efficient, you'll make it more effective. And neither of those two things is a safe assumption. And then, then, as I said, they go from being a tradition and they become a trap, which is it's impossible to take the opposite point of view. Okay. <laughs> in other words, the thing becomes so widely believed that the future is the internet, <clears throat> that if you suggest direct mail in a meeting, people will laugh at you. And that's when the thing has gone from being a tradition to being a trap. And I actually, I think one of the important things with behavioral science is spotting behavioral biases in ourselves, which is to spot the moments where once mental models that were used for convenience 
started becoming theories, traditions, and traps. And I think the reason for that, I, I actually really challenge things quite a lot. So one of the biggest ones I've, uh, I've happily challenged uh, is the idea that futurism is all about living in big cities, okay? So there's this assumption, if you see any model about the future, it talks about smart cities, never talks about smart market towns or smart hamlets. It assumes we're all going to be living in high density, high rise accommodation in global mega cities. OK, um, and. Um, and I said, hold on a second, OK, you know, particularly after the Zoom revolution, we're probably going to see a bit of an exodus. I don't think you'll see an exodus from Bristol, Newcastle, Cambridge much, maybe a bit. OK, but the point about Bristol, Newcastle, Cambridge or Hamilton, for that matter, whether it's in Scotland or in Canada, is they're small enough that if you work in Hamilton or you work in um, Cambridge or whatever, you can be as rural or as urban as you like. Because, you know, you can live out in the countryside and commuting in, except in Cambridge, the most car-unfriendly city I've ever come across. Um, but you can basically commute in fairly easily from outside. It's not intolerable if you want to have a more rural existence. Whereas London is so big that you actually have to go about 30 miles from work before you start getting duck ponds, okay? And so you might argue that very big cities are actually rather cruel because they force people, particularly with a dual income household, right? Because if you're both earning money in a couple or in a relationship, okay? Moving out means you've got two commutes. You've got two really, now that, you know, again, if you're a couple and you decide you want to live outside Cambridge, but work in Cambridge, you can probably share the drive in. Trust me, if one of you lives in Paddington and the other one of you works in the city of London, you're not sharing the drive in. It's impossible. OK, you reach a whole level of, of uh, logistical difficulty. You know, if you think about it, where, if, if one of you works in Paddington, and the other one works in the city of London. How do you even move out of London anyway? Because if you move to Kent, the city guy will have an OK commute, but the Paddington person will have a nightmare. And if you move to Bath or, you know, or Burnham or whatever, it's the other way around. OK, you can't even do that. So I was asking the question genuinely, which is, do people move to cities because they've got a degree and they need to make enough money to justify their degree? And then having moved to a city, particularly when they're young, they find it quite easy to post rationalize reasons why they like living in cities. OK, because there are just more people around there, more romantic partners around their nightclubs, their sporting events, their crowded, noisy things where you take drugs and shout woo, which is what young people like. And then they get a sense of identity that they're a city person and it becomes impossible for them to move out, even though, to be honest, at the age of about 35, 40, your quality of life would significantly improve if you did. You know, and. You know, I, 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 you know, it's a really interesting question, which is, are you actually a prisoner of your own narrative, which is you told this story about how you have to live in a city? And we get fed an awful lot of urban propaganda, don't we? You know, the BBC, basically, you know, if you have a drama, you know, people in the suburbs are just a bunch of curtain twitchers reading the Daily Mail, occasionally engaging in bouts of dogging, you know, whereas city people are all really sophisticated, benign, helpful, kind to their neighbours, when in reality, of course, it's a bit the other way around. By which I mean that actually when you get out into rural areas, people are a bit more kind, kind and more helpful to their neighbours than they are in cities. And cities don't even know who your neighbours are half the time, right? And so, you know, I think it's really, really important that we actually question things where our, our whole approach to thinking has become trapped. And this brings me to this big trap, which I think is happening because of big data. Uh, and I think it's happening because of... Um, a need to look objective in business, a need to make your decision making look scientific is leading people now, along with the promise of big data and to some extent the siren allure of tech companies, okay, is leading people to try and engage in what I call imagination free decision making. And let me explain very quickly why it doesn't work and why we always say we need behavioral science as a mode and a framework for inquiry, but we need it married to creativity every time. And I'll explain it very simply, which is that John Cleese actually, who also gives a talk at Nudgestock, which you can also see if you go to the Ogilvy Consulting YouTube site, uh, underneath 
where the comments normally go. We haven't yet split the individual talks into individual films, but we have chaptered the whole thing. So you can click on a chapter and it'll take you straight to John Cleese's talk. And he's talking about creativity. And he repeatedly gave an example, which I also gave in Alchemy, which is high school maths, which is two buses leave a bus station at noon. One travels due west at a constant 40 kilometers an hour. Uh, one travels due north at a constant 30 kilometers an hour. What time will it be when the buses are 100 kilometers apart? Which I think is two hours, it's two o'clock in the afternoon, okay? Now, those are, that is the science of high school maths questions, okay? And what distinguishes high school maths questions is you are given all the information and nothing else that is necessary to solve the problem. You know everything there is to, uh, uh, to, to solve the problem and anything that isn't in the question, you can assume away, okay? So in reality, we always did this at school, and, we, uh, and you know, you'd always have the, the, the naughty kid at school who'd write the answer, five o'clock in the afternoon because the bus got stuck in traffic, right? Okay, that was the naughty kid. And he got naught marks for doing that because that's not playing the game. You've got to play the game by assuming that buses, which never happens, leave simultaneously, travel in a straight line and at an absolutely constant rate without even the need to accelerate, I might add, okay? Therefore breaking the laws of physics. And they travel in a completely straight line without encountering any obstacle or interruption at all. And you, ironically, you get the right answer for pretending that this is possible. Whereas if you're the cheeky kid who writes uh, midnight because the, one of the buses broke down, okay, you get, you know, you get sent to detention. Despite the fact, to be honest, <laughs> that what we need in business decision making is sometimes the cheeky kid. I'll, I'll tell there's a wonderful example you can cite about this, which is when somebody is asked a question in a physics exam, how you find the height of a very tall skyscraper using a barometer. And of course, what you're supposed to do is measure the difference in air pressure at the bottom of the building at the top and use the difference in air pressure to calculate the height. But this chap being perverse sent in about five different answers, including you throw the barometer off the top of the building and count how long it takes to hit the ground. Uh, you attach a piece of string to the barometer and hang it off the building. Length of string plus length of barometer equals height of building. And his third suggestion was rather lovely, which is you find out the architect of the original building and say, if you tell me how tall the building is, I'll give you this nice barometer. <laughs> okay. Now, they're all in real world terms. They're all perfectly valid answers to the question. Okay. But in maths world, they're cheating because they're not solving the problem the way you're supposed to solve it. Yeah. And the interesting thing there is really is a really important point, which is that in real world decision making, and that even applies when you've got a huge database, when you've got amazing data processing capacity, you never know everything you need to know to answer the question. It's called decision making under uncertainty. In many cases, there are known unknowns and there are even unknown unknowns, which is you can't even imagine the things you need to know in order to answer the question. And what that means in such circumstances, you can be scientific, but you could only be scientific if you're also creative. It's a bit like Bayes' theorem. A lot of people don't like Bayes' theorem because they go, but you've got to assume the prior. And that involves human subjective decision making. And therefore, my decision is now impure. They don't mean the decision is impure. They mean that if you make a decision that involves subjective judgment, you can get into trouble for it. An awful lot of this urge to rely on data and nothing else in order to make decisions is actually driven by the instinct in business decision making that if the model told me to do it, it's, no, it's never my fault. It's like computer says no. I was told to do this by the model. Therefore, um, I'm now no longer actually involved in the decision and I can't be blamed. It's nothing to do with the quality of the decision you make. It's all to do with how you can defend the decision in the event that it goes wrong. OK, so I'll end on this very quickly, but it's a really, really important point. When you don't know everything you need to know, the way science proceeds, and the guy who spotted this, a guy called Charles Sanders, was it James? James Sanders Peirce, one or the other. Um, Sanders Peirce, P-E-I-R-S-R-C-E, -E, which is weirdly pronounced Peirce, not Pierce. 
who's probably the greatest American logician of the 19th century. And he said, no, no, no. There are many, many cases in science and in life where you can't proceed through deduction or induction. Because the information you need to make a decision isn't present in all its forms, either because people won't tell you or because people can't tell you or because it's not or in many cases in modern business, it's not expressible in numerical form. OK, so we spent a fortune optimizing taxi arrival times and Uber came along and did it with a map. And the reason the map reduces taxi arrival times is it does it perceptually. It doesn't do it absolutely. It simply is based on the psychological insight that if you know where your cab is, you're not that panicked. OK, if I can see my Uber. Thank you very much indeed for it's Charles. It is Charles. Thank you ever so much. Um, so anyway, if you put a map there and I can see my car approaching, I'm no longer in a state of panic or anxiety. I'm no longer. Maybe he's already been. Maybe he's parked around the corner. Uh, what if he's not coming at all? Oh, my God. OK, once you put that little cab on the map there, I'm not. I'm basically oh, look, he's stuck at those traffic lights for a few minutes. OK, I'll have another pint. OK, it doesn't change the duration of the arrival time, but it completely transforms the psychological experience of waiting, which was the original problem to be solved in the most in the most part. OK. Now, the importance of this stuff is that what Pierce said um, is that the in, in most scientific problems and the classic cases would be penicillin and Darwin. OK, you don't actually solve a problem through sequential logic. You solve it through what's called abductive inference. Peirce called this abduction, which is a terrible word because it sounds like you've kidnapped a child for some pervy reason, OK? But abductive inference is a much better reason, OK? A, a much better phrase. And abductive inference is when you effectively go, either this thing is strange, like why do all these finches have different shaped beaks? Or why are these people... Uh, why is their ordering of BT star services heavily dependent on the mode of the channel by which they can actually respond to the original message? And you notice something unusual and you ask the question, what would need to be true for this to pertain? In other words, what would need to be true for this to be normal? And that's what Darwin did, OK? In order for these finches to have different shaped beaks on islands only four miles apart, where the beaks are very well adapted to the shape of the foliage, nature would need to have a mechanism which varied and selected. And so it's the whole of Darwin's theory, it's still a theory, technically. It's, you know, it, it, most people acknowledge it's true. Um, he didn't have, he didn't have, don't get, he didn't have any sort of information on genes. He never knew about Mendel. So he didn't know how the mechanism worked, but he just hypothesized a mechanism whereby this could happen. And if you look at, you know, again, Fleming, he goes, that's weird, all those bacteria have died. Hypothesis, it's an imaginative act. And Peirce admits this has to be an imaginative act and it's fundamentally part of science and logic. And it's something which when you think about it, humans can do. Now, who else does it? Detectives. There's a passage actually, and I think the sign of four, where Sherlock Holmes gives a talk on reasoning backwards. In other words, humans have evolved very, very natural facilities for saying this happened, so this will probably happen next. Humans aren't quite as good naturally at going, this happened, what must have had to happen first in order for this to happen? Now, what we're doing in marketing, I would argue, much of the time, is we're doing abductive inference about the future, which is, I would like it if more people came to my restaurant. What would have to be true in order for more people to come to my restaurant? And I think that's what we do. If you want to describe the behavioral science practice, I think it's a necessary phase. Now, the other thing I'd say is this means that creativity and marketing is like a vaccine. You need more than one dose. And I think we've made the great mistake. This is the other reason I founded the behavioral science practice, which is we leave the creativity till last. We do all the grunt work and we do all the analysis and assessment, all of which is quite right, because you'll do better abductive inference if you're possessed of more facts. Right. If Darwin had stayed in Bromley, I don't think he would have come up with much. Actually, he didn't live in Bromley until he got back, did he? Um, you know, I'm not being rude about Bromley. I lived nearby. Lovely place. OK, but I'm just saying if Darwin hadn't actually assembled quite a lot of data, he wouldn't have got there. But nevertheless, it was an act of abruptive inference, which is what would have to be true in order for this to pertain. And, you know, again, that's what Fleming did. That's what I think marketers have to do.
And what fascinates me is you can sometimes go and say, this cafe isn't doing as well as we expected. Why not? That would be a great marketing question. I don't know why my camera is going slightly weird. What's it doing here? Come on. Anyway. Um, but the interesting fact there, which fascinates me, is sometimes you go, this cafe isn't doing as well as it should. And this is exactly the case. Now I said, OK, let's look at why it is. Maybe a coffee shit. You know, uh, maybe you've got horrible customer service staff. That, that, that would explain what we're finding. Maybe it's just that nobody notices you're there and you're on a fast moving road. Now, I went to one cafe and said, um, I think I've got one tip for you as a cafe. I said, OK. And this is when you start to get evidence that your theory might be right. OK, this is this is the thing that I love most of all, where you 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 abduct, abductively, inferentially, creatively hypothesize a reason and you do a little test or you get a little bit of evidence which further confirms it. And this is my favorite little story, because what I love about this behavioral science gig is you don't just have to work for Unilever. You can give advice to a cafe. And the advice I gave to one cafe, which is on quite a busy road, but it's advice I give to all cafes, which is even if it's raining, leave your chairs and tables outside the building. Because from 200 yards away, um, we can see there's a cafe and we know it's open. It's one thing to know there's a cafe there, but in particular in Britain, when tea shops and cafes close all over the, you know, the closing times are all over the shop. If you can see they left their chairs and tables out, they're obviously open because if they weren't open, um, uh, they'd uh, have put locked them away to stop people nicking them. And I said, the great thing about having tables and chairs on the pavement is it's basically a huge neon sign saying cafe open, talking to everybody's unconscious within a 300 yard radius, okay? And I partly discovered this because I went to Milan and I'm in Italy and I go, well, we're in Milan, so we'll look for a cafe. And I looked down all the streets and there weren't any tables and chairs. Okay, that's weird. There don't seem to be any restaurants in Milan. I wasn't expecting that. Now in Milan, of course, it's Northern Italy. They don't put tables and chairs out on the streets. And so I was looking down streets going, no, nowhere to eat down there, nowhere to eat down there. It took me ages to realize that weirdly in Milan, you basically don't do that shit. That's what you do in Rome or you do in Naples. And so I was completely flummoxed by, you know, a change to the architectural environment. And it was all based on unconscious stuff. Now, the best thing happened when I had this theory about leaving your tables and chairs out. One, the cafe next to me started doing it and started doing much, much better business. And the second thing that happened was fantastic, which is someone got in touch with me and said, I think what you're saying is right. I said, why? They said, because I used to work for a cafe, okay? And we were only paid to work till four. That's when the cafe closed. We didn't get paid. All the time we had to spend cleaning the cappuccino machine and all that after four, we weren't paid for. <coughs> so we really didn't want any customers after 3.30, okay? And they said, um, uh, so do you know what we did? I said, no, I haven't got a clue. They said, all you had to do was take one chair and stack it upside down on top of another chair. Nobody ever came in and ordered anything. That single sign that we're about to put the chairs away, you know what I mean? Where, they, where you put one chair and you either put it upside down on the table so you can clean underneath it, or you just put it upside down on another chair. They said, at quarter to four, you just bang one or two chairs on top of each other. You leave everything else open. The boss couldn't give you a bollocking, right? Because you hadn't closed the cafe early. The cafe was still open. If anybody came in, but nobody ever did. And that's the kind of stuff which we need. To, that goes back all the way back to my funny little direct marketing experience in 1991 with BT. It's this kind of stuff we need to know more about because there must be brilliant businesses that fail because of this shit all the time. And if we're not having imaginative ideas about the why, we're missing brilliant stuff. So there you go. That's me. And um, I, I, I'm going to have to scroll back through a billion questions now, but I'm very, very happy for you, Joe, to do a bit of, of, of uh, VJing or Zoom jockeying. <laughs> Thank you very, very Absolute much. Absolute pleasure. <laughs> there, there's so many lovely, lovely comments coming in. Uh, Rory, if you, you'll actually find the questions in the Q&A feature. Um, so... Yes. Oh, right, 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 right. Here we are. I, I was looking at the chat, which was going, going gangbusters. Please. Yeah, no, you, you got no chance in there. It's... Um... It, it's so lovely to see and, and just so many lovely, lovely comments as well from. OK, uh, yeah, refusing to use direct mail is a terrible mistake because direct mail does things which other things don't. 
apart from the else, it actually makes you think, do I want to do this or don't I, before you throw it away. Um, I, I'm surprised that your manager thinks it's not testable. It's usually very testable and trackable. Unless you've become so digital, you can no longer track direct mail. Um, yeah, I, um, this is the one thing, by the way. Okay, the reason you need to test is because hypotheses need validation and they need exploration. <clears throat> the only other bit of advice I give you is test really stupid things. So we did, a, we did a series of five tests for Christian Aid Week where we did five changes to the envelope. Okay, one of them was totally logical where you wouldn't even have needed, uh, no one would have thought it needed testing. Okay, the other four were completely illogical, which we had to test in order to justify them. They were things like making the paper quality higher, changing the position of the flap, putting a message on saying delivered by hand, okay, which is kind of reciprocation bias. The four irrational ideas all worked, you know, maybe 10, 15% uplift. And next year, we can arguably combine all four and get an even bigger uplift. We'll have to test that as well. The one logical intervention, which was mentioning gift aid, was a total disaster. It actually reduced both donation size and the number of people giving to a point where actually you, you made 40% or 30% less money. So the rational thing was killing kids and the irrational things were saving them, basically. And so if you want a Rory Sutherland kind of bit of advice, before you drop the price on a product that isn't selling, you should test putting the price up because it's less likely to happen, but it's a much more valuable discovery when it does. And people who are trapped in economic theory, and it's gone from being a toy to a tradition to a theory, to a sorry, from toy to a theory to a tradition to a trap, just go, if you drop the price, demand goes up. If you raise the price, demand goes down. Um, that's, that's a hypothesis, okay? It's not a bloody axiom. And yet we have people who are appearing to be, who are trying to look scientific. By, and the reason they're doing this is business people love reducing the number of possible variables. And so once you introduce psychology into the mix, it's got to become a subjective decision. And business people hate making subjective decisions because you can get blamed for them. And because they've all been through the British education system, as John Cleese says, which basically teaches you absolutely everything except how to be creative. It teaches you how to answer those bus station questions, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't teach you how to ask um, um, uh, the really perverse, ask perverse questions. You know, you start off with the future is all about urbanization. I don't think it is. I mean, if you look at patterns of human movement over 2000 years, there are huge periods, you know, the coming of the railways, the 1970s, etc., where there was massive migration out of cities into the suburbs and the countryside. OK, and the most interesting thing that came to me was when a guy got in touch with me. I was thinking of this as purely a Western phenomenon. And this guy got in touch with me from Kenya, who runs this fantastic program in Kenya. And he said, we've got a disaster in Kenya because everybody's been taught you've got to move to the cities. But the biggest opportunities in Kenya are in agritech, right? You've got this fantastic potential for transforming agriculture and growing food. And instead, everybody's going, must move to a city. And so his great question to me is, how do we actually reverse this? And, you know, part of it's going to be, you know, actually, you know, Zoom, you create, you, you use this new technology in conjunction with psychology. I mean, when you think about it, right, okay, business trying to make decisions with what it knows and not knowing and not experimenting with what it doesn't yet know meant that it took a pandemic to get us all using Zoom. Now, I'm not suggesting we should use Zoom as much as we do under lockdown conditions, by the way. And I'm not suggesting that lockdown is a reasonable experiment for flexible working, because it isn't. It's an experiment with what it's like to be under house arrest. And the experience is going to be hugely different depending on your house, your circumstances, who you live with. You know, if you've got a psycho flatmate, I imagine this has been an absolute disaster, right? But businesses should have been experimenting with Zoom four years ago, five years ago. And they should have been, you know, and I did. I, I did experiments with Zoom and I discovered a very interesting experiment, which is you couldn't get people a, a very interesting finding, which was the reason it wasn't happening was that everybody felt that working flexibly was a concession. And they felt that they were burning brownie points every time they actually worked flexibly and they felt guilty about it. 
And they thought, well, I'm, I'm glad that Rory allows us to work flexibly, but I'll save that up to a time when I really need it. And I had to go and say to my team, no, no, no you don't understand me. I want you to work from home one day a week because I want to see how it works. And it was only when I said, I actively prefer it if you work from home, that a majority of people started doing it. And so there was a whole framing question that had to be overcome. And in the end, it took the government to say, you know, if you don't work from home, we'll arrest you, to actually perform an experiment we should have been doing voluntarily five years earlier. So, okay, what to learn about, apart from my book, Crikey. Mm. 42 courses, have a look at the behavioral economics courses on 42 courses. Uh, they're very good. Um, if you want to go really deep, there are courses at London School of Economics and elsewhere. There are one year master's courses in behavioral economics. Don't do a PhD. It's too much time spent studying one thing. You know, we want people who generally know about behavioral science, not people who've spent seven years of their life researching the endowment effect or something. You know, that's too extreme. Um, but equally, MOOCs and online courses. There are a range of very good books, obviously Thinking Fast and Slow, Predictably Irrational. The Choice Factory by Richard Shotton is a superb book. There's another brilliant book called The Business of Choice, written by my old colleague, uh, Richard Chataway. Uh, another colleague of mine, Sam Tatum, has a book coming out uh, very shortly. Um, there are, um, uh, what other entities are? There's behavioraleconomist.org, I think. At, or is it behavioraleconomics.org? And there's another there's another website called Inside BE, which is a really good resource. Uh, how do you sell solutions to companies who don't know what their problem is? I completely agree. Uh, it's a tough problem because uh, you can go in with a hypothesis. You can go in, luckily, with case studies. Okay, Joe would like to answer this question live, so I'll hand back to Joe, and we'll do a few more. We'll do a few no, more no, questions. no, no. I, I was I was just uh, clearing out. Rory, it's all yours. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, any way you can apply something very simple to a business or a client business. One other form of, um, uh, of what you might call applied creativity or practical, pragmatic creativity is pattern recognition. Is finding patterns in other things which you then apply to somewhere else. And so, you know, one of the questions you might ask is, um, we discovered with KFC in Australia that um, uh, actually the best way to sell, they have a, a, a brief offer every year, which is chips for a dollar. And the best way to sell those is to say maximum four per customer. It was originally in the legal restrictions. And when we made it a headline, there was a huge uptick in sales of the fries. And not only that, not only that, but more people bought three or four. Um, and um, yeah, now here we are. Does marketing permeate and inform all business functions today? And the answer to that is no, and it's a huge problem. So that's another book recommendation, which is The Silo Effect by Gillian Tett, who's a brilliant anthropologist who writes for the FT. And she's a kind of uh, devotee of anthropologists like Bourdieu, I think it's Bourdieu, isn't it? The French anthropologist. But she finds herself working in business and looking at business people through the eyes of an anthropologist. And she's just written a book called Anthropovision. And most interesting ideas in business emerge at the intersection between disciplines. One of the things we often do in the behavioral science practice is when we have a meeting, we say to our typically marketing clients, look, the meeting's happening on Zoom, so there's no constraint on seats. To be honest, there's no constraint on time much because if you invite someone from procurement or from operations or from, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, you might invite someone from manufacturing, OK, or from your R&D labs. If they find the conversation boring and useless, they can, on Zoom, they can just get on with some other work anyway. OK, but actually invite people from other disciplines because you're more likely to find a solution or, or a problem that can be solved in a conversation between marketing and logistics than you are if you purely look within marketing or purely look within logistics. Uh, so um, uh, so how, how marketing and content have helped the business grow? Um, uh, actually, uh, most content, I think, helps business grow. It's just not always possible to measure. Now, that's not universally true. It's not always possible to measure, and it doesn't always get the credit. Because when you write a Harvard Business Review, case study of a business, you'd much rather say our success was down to superior cost control and um, supply chain management than to say we were better marketers than the other guys. Okay, so a lot of business success is much more down to marketing. Indeed, 
I would argue that let's take five guys, okay? Most really interesting innovations, five guys, Nespresso, Dyson, Red Bull, Perrier, which was the original bottled water, okay? They're all marketing successes, okay? Nobody thinks of them as that because when your marketing succeeds, um, people write their own stories about why they need the product. And so marketing then falls into that. Now, I'll give you a lovely example of my favorite ad is from 1916 in Ireland. And it's an ad where the headline says, use electricity. And it's encouraging people in Dublin in 1916 to get electricity installed in their homes and explaining why an electric kettle is better than a gas kettle, including the reason that I take the kettle and toaster upstairs to my bedroom at night so I can make breakfast without coming downstairs. Now, nobody in the history of the world has ever done that, OK? But a copywriter needed to come up with reasons why electric was better than gas. Now, nowadays, because you've got televisions and washing machines and everything else, the idea that you buy a house that wasn't connected to the electricity and need to be persuaded to install electricity day one, okay, you'd be there basically going, I desperately need an electrical supply to this house, I can't even survive. Every significant innovation from the Ford Model T to electricity to electric light, okay, all of those things, the internet, have required huge marketing. It looks in retrospect as though they actually achieve penetration naturally. Nothing new ever gets adopted without some cunning marketing. It, it's incredibly rare. So everything, okay, everything, every product and every service is on a spectrum. And the spectrum I describe as the marketing end of the spectrum is you fight so the, the, the conventional business end of the spectrum, which still involves a lot of marketing is you find out what people want and you work out a really clever way to make it. Now that, there, the ingenuity is in the technology, okay? But you still need a marketer to work out what people want, but then the technologist finds a really clever way to either manufacture it or provide it. The alternative is you work out what you can provide and you find out a really clever way to make people want it. Now, okay, the most extreme example of that is probably the pet rock you know, uh, or actually NFTs, NFTs, these things where they're selling digital works of art to people for millions of dollars. That's actually, you know, 100% marketing, 0% product, the pet rock, pretty much, you know, okay, because rocks always existed, someone just had the brilliant idea of selling them as pets. Okay, at the other extreme, you probably have salt in the late Middle Ages, where everybody wanted salt, and it was just a question of supplying it. Okay. <coughs> Even that salt would have required marketing at some point in its introduction to human culture, okay? Because human culture is heavily driven by habit. And people do what they did before and they do what everybody else does. So I think it's really important to understand. And by the way, I'll give you a lovely example of this where marketing hasn't been deployed and where I think it's a disaster, okay? So some of the cleverest people in the world have developed solar panels. They made them more efficient, cheaper to manufacture. They made them lighter, easier to install. They actually work in countries like Britain. When I was a kid, you could have solar panels if you lived in Arizona. It was a total waste of time anywhere else. You know, we were talking about putting them in the Sahara Desert. Now they actually work in the UK. It's actually worth having. But how, how many of you, now, the assumption is to get solar power in your home, you've got to spend £30,000 on a one-off irreversible decision where something's attached to a home, which you're probably planning to sell in five years anyway, okay? And where if anything goes wrong, you basically have spent £30,000 only to discover that your electricity supplier won't actually credit you for any power you feed back into the grid, right? So there you have a case where total genius has been applied to the product itself, but total morons have tried to sell it. And actually, it's the same people. It never occurred because they looked at economics. and They said, well, all we need to do is have panels that pay back. OK, that in other words, now nobody ever said if there's one decision a consumer hates making, it's a £30,000 upfront decision, one off payment irreversible, which might go disastrously wrong. That's like asking people to move their bank account, okay? People don't move their bank account, not because it doesn't make sense, but because there's a 3% chance of a living disaster, right? Okay, that's why people don't tinker with those things. Now, what you need with solar panels is a marketer. You need them sold in John Lewis, you need them to cost a thousand pounds and you need it to be modular. And maybe you need to say, start off by charging a Tesla or start off by charging a Nissan Leaf. And then you can buy another panel and you can have a solar powered conservatory. Now, I've got these Philips Hue, you know, uh, Alexa, 
Turn the study lights red. See if there's, yeah, yeah, right, okay. I've got these Philips Hue lights in my home. Did I buy them all at once? Did I fuck, right? Okay, if someone had come to me and said, okay, uh, hey mate, I can actually install your whole home with internet connected color changing light bulbs. It'll only cost you a thousand pounds. I would have said, basically swivel, mate. That's stupid, right? I bought them two at a time and eventually some lights blew and I thought, actually, I'll put Hue lights in there. And then my daughter moved into a bedroom which didn't have a light switch. And I worked out it was cheaper to give her four Hue lights and a remote switch than to get an, an electrician up to install a, a switch in the wall. So she just controls her lights remotely. And so we don't, she doesn't have to shout downstairs and say, turn the lights off because there's now a remote switch. That was cheaper than getting an electrician out, okay? And so bit by bit, I've probably got 700 quid's worth of these bulbs in the house. Would I have bought them all at once? Not a chance in hell. Alexa, turn the study lights white. So looking a bit of a brothel feel you probably don't want. Um, but the point I'm making is that, uh, actually, they still seem to be red, don't they? Like, oh, my wife's closed the door for the kitchen. Don't worry, I'll get it back to normal again soon. But this is the kind of thing where everything's marketing, okay? Everything that involves people changing their behaviour, it's a marketing problem. There are a bunch of economists and engineers out there pretending it isn't. It always is. So I'll give you the classic example, going to British Airways and saying, let's look at the train, uh, you know, let's look at flight punctuality. And I said, look, um, the first thing you've got to look at with flight punctuality, if you're interested in passenger satisfaction, isn't the punctuality, it's airport information. BA246 delayed 35 minutes. To be honest, half the time I'm pleased, oh, I'll get on with a blue email, go to the lounge, you know, go and buy a pair of sunglasses for 150 quid and then go, why the fuck did I buy those two days later? You know what you do in an airport, right? Okay, you know, but actually airports aren't that boring. Delayed 35 minutes, nobody, nobody's planned their day, even in business, down to that level of precision, right? And also I know what to do. I can contact the taxi driver and say flight's a bit delayed just to let you know, okay, if, if I'm being picked up. Okay. Now, BA246 delayed, without any ancillary information, is a psychological disaster zone. People start going, oh, it's just a prelude to being cancelled. And now I can't actually get on with a bit of work. I've got to sit here staring at the board like a moron every two minutes to see what the next piece of information is. So they were looking at flight punctuality through a logistical lens, but half the importance of flight punctuality isn't manifested in duration or time. It's manifested in human uncertainty. And so by treating it as a logistical problem, not a psychological problem, they were missing half of the solution. Any more? There's, there's a bunch in the, in the Q&A, Rory, but how long do you want to go for? I mean, uh, well, I, I can go for about another, I can go for another 10 minutes, I think. Is that, is that what, what do we have scheduled? Because I've got, I have got one meeting coming up. But uh, well, we, we had you in for an hour, but uh, I think people could listen to you all day long. So uh, well, let's, let's give it another 10. That'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. and then we can always do a follow up. I'm totally happy to do a follow up Q&A only session. Yeah, that would be really lovely. We would we'd absolutely love that. Absolutely love that. Um, let's have a look at some of the questions. Um, there's, there's one that you could answer very, very quickly, uh, which is one from Charlotte, but I'm sure it's one that many people will be interested in, which is uh, Charlotte asks, do you have a podcast or anywhere that people want to, uh, who want to hear more from you uh, other than a, a pure Q&A session with us? Uh, where can they hear more from you, Rory? Uh, if you Google on YouTube, if you look for Rory Sutherland on YouTube, you'll find tons of stuff, genuinely. Uh, podcasts, <clears throat> I am about to put together all my podcasts in some, um, uh, you know, in, in a kind of digest. So that will go online. Um, my Twitter feed is one of the best ways, actually, because whenever I'm appearing on something, I'll usually tweet it. Um, so at Rory Sutherland on Twitter. And that, and the other re the other reason to be on Twitter is that uh, if you watch who I follow, retweet, reply to, there's a fantastic behavioral science community on Twitter who share an enormous amount of information. Okay. That's great. The modern That's day cool. touch points is wonderful. Yeah, um, mailing, telephone numbers. Uh, I think we've become uh, we we should be channel agnostic, and we're not. We're actually. I, I think we've been overly. I, I think we've over optimized around digital. Actually. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And actually, Mark Ritson was making a point on that last week. I was watching a talk and um, he was saying, actually, that 
the the uh, the data shows that the more channels that you can actually do, the better. Um, albeit, you know, within yes, a, a, within reason. Yeah, 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 absolutely right. And there's a multiplier effect in advertising, by the way, which is if people hear your ad on the radio and see it on TV, or if people see your, di- we always do that working on American Express. When American Express was putting brand ads out, the response rate to mail always went up. Interesting. It is, you know, it, it's, it makes sense when you think about the, the logic, ironically. Um, but um, there's a question here from Carl, actually, which uh, is a relevant one in, in sort of like marketing sort of conversation right now. Um, it probably steps a little bit out of what you tend to speak on, Rory, but I'd be interested in your view nonetheless. Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, your view on <coughs> brand, your view on brand purpose. Oh, OK. Um, uh, yeah, I'm mixed because... I was one of the people only peripherally behind the Dove campaign, which is often considered one of the first of the pro-social advertising campaigns about real beauty, beauty without artifice. But it's highly relevant to the product, okay, first of all, because that's exactly what Dove is, okay? It's not a cosmetics brand. It's a you know, natural beauty brand. I I do get a bit concerned when I see practically every brand doing an ad for the 2008 Obama campaign or doing an ad for a... And the the reasons I'm concerned about it is, one, it's not a good idea to polarise your audience. Now, the the, the debate is out as to how successful um, uh, the uh, Colin Kaepernick ad was for Nike. But that was highly relevant, Okay, right? And also, there are a lot of people who uh, are keen Nike buyers uh, who, um, uh, you know, will support the campaign. There there was a backlash against it. But nonetheless, it you know, you could argue it's consistent. Nike has always been that kind of company in the same way that Ben and Jerry's is to an extent. Okay, where I got more concerned was the Gillette ad, which was a kind of assault on toxic masculinity. Okay, Mm -hmm. it was undoubtedly true that you needed to update the Gillette proposition for the 21st century. Um, Okay, where I think it it misjudged it is it started conflating major and minor infractions. So it started off with kind of radio coverage. This is the thing even, so this isn't my opinion, it's my wife's opinion, because I don't, you know, because I thought it was worth asking for, you know, judgments on this. It was conflating things like the um, uh, Weinstein and, you know, and, uh, you know, cases of absolute sexual assault, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it started with radio coverage of the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. And it ended up with, like, there were two kids, boys actually, play fighting at a barbecue, okay? Well, okay, I mean, okay, primates have engaged in play fight, all right, for about a million years. Nearly all mammals engage in play fighting. Humour, some people argue, is a form of verbal play fighting, okay? I thought it was a bit dodgy, effectively. What it was doing, okay, this is, this is something you've got to be really alert to, okay? There's a difference between signalling virtue and virtue signalling. Signaling virtue is when you do something virtuous and you're responsible for the consequences and you signal the fact. Now, you know, that, you know, you, you know, you, if, if a company decides to pay all its taxes and then does an ad saying we're paying tax in the UK, that's not virtue signaling, that's signaling virtue. OK, mm-hmm. there's another form of virtue signaling, which is a, now Ritson is very good on this. So all follow Mark Ritson. He said, there are a load of companies that are basically dodging their tax. They're not paying tax. Uh, you know, they're manufacturing things in sweatshops. And then they go to a kind of young Western wealthy audience and say, we're going to say this nice thing. OK, and therefore um, we're, we're, we're good people. OK, and Ritson says in so many cases, you know, what you would say to these companies is, look, if you're going to be virtuous, pay your gun and tax. Don't don't just make these because there's an element to business greenwashing, which is almost like I get it. So if we say all the right things about the environment and about gender, OK, you let us keep all the money. And the point I'm making there is that um, I, um One, it's not a good idea to insult your customers. And what Gillette was doing was more or less insulting its own customers. Okay, and let's face it, you had 30 years of pretty macho Gillette advertising. Okay, 
uh, you know, it wasn't as if they'd been, you know, in the long term, uh, they'd been, uh, you know, a massively woke company. And I, th I, I think there are problems with it in terms of credibility, which is if you do that stuff and then you, you're found not paying a tax, you're going to get doubly punished. OK. You know, um, and the second thing is, if you engage, if you engage in communication, OK, for a worthy cause, there are two kinds of communication. OK, there is communication where you you make the message and you experience the consequences of the message. Now, generally speaking, OK, what bothered me a bit was white people saying defund the police. Right. Now, were there many people of color saying defund the police? And the answer is actually not that many, because many people of color live in areas where you do need more protection. Now, a bunch of white people who live in the richest part of Portland, Oregon, saying defund the police is easy to say it makes you look good, but you don't suffer the consequences. And generally, I think people signaling things where which is cheap talk, where you don't either have to pay for the message, nor do you have to suffer the consequences of what you propose. OK. Um, I think gets gets uh, 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 obtains a bad reaction in people. So I, I'm not Steve. Steve Harrison is very, very against the uh, the kind of virtue signaling tendency in advertising. I'm highly skeptical about it, which is not to say that you should never do it. If you've done something worthwhile, if you've decided to pay 100 million in tax voluntarily, I would argue it's a big marketing mistake not to make that fact known. OK, but on the other hand, Getting involved in highly polarized political discussions and taking an extreme position on them. Everything we know from Byron Sharp, everything we know from Mark Ritson is that brands grow through breadth of penetration and breadth of penetration means breadth of acceptance. OK, and so massively polarizing an audience to make a very unrepresentative group of advertising people who all live in me mega cities and who all vote Democrat. OK. Right. I, I doubt there's anybody in Ogilvy, New York, who's a self-proclaimed Republican voter outside the post room. OK. Right. Now, we've got to remember that people who work in marketing are highly unrepresentative. They're, they're much bigger. They're much higher on openness. They tend to be higher on political liberalism than people in the mainstream market. OK. And we've got to be really, really alert to this because. One thing, you Ford has never run an ad insulting General Motors buyers because they know these people aren't the opposition. They're the people we've got to win over. And if you're if you're campaigning in a kind of political campaign where what you're signaling is allegiance to the cause, the, the communications mode you adopt is one which actually is highly repellent to people who disagree with you. OK, you know, I occasionally get planners saying I really like this ad because it boils the piss of Daily Mail readers. And I go, hold on a second. OK. First of all, there are two things you, you might want to persuade Daily Mail readers to think your way, in which case boiling their piss probably isn't going to work. OK, because there's a thing called reactance theory, which is we will automatically adopt a contrarian position if we're told to do something repeatedly by people we don't like. OK, so a lot of this stuff, we've got to be alert to reactance theory. Now, interestingly, I've seen very, very little communication by people of colour in the Black Lives Matter movement, okay, which I found even remotely annoying, and I found most of it extremely informative. Because if you think about it, my job is look at the look at the world through a different viewpoint, and I don't know what it's like to be okay. You know, I worked my, my one of my um, my partners, creative director Rogelby, for many years was uh, his family were originally um, from the Caribbean, okay, and I suddenly realised that we'd both been stopped by the police for stupid reasons. Now, okay, now. Regardless of what the reason the cop had for stopping us, which in neither case will we ever know, his interpretation of the event was totally different to mine, OK, which is I'm basically a black guy in a nice car and you've, you've stopped me, which may well have been the reason, by the way. OK, and my, my reason, I'm a white guy in a nice car and I go, this cop's a fucking idiot. You know, he claimed I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. I obviously was wearing a seatbelt. And this, this was a completely bizarre incident which happened. OK, it happened to be twice actually in the same town. And um, the so, I, you know, it's really, really important for every marketer to realize that depending on your context, depending on your circumstances, depending on your past experiences, the way you experience things are very different. Now, I don't think most people are I don't think a significant number of people are nastily racist. OK, and I think that I, I would make that statement in the UK in 2021. 
But then it suddenly occurred to me, you don't need many people to be nastily racist to make the experience of people of colour totally different. Now, to give an example, OK, you know, I'm an annoyingly posh English person. If I walked around in Glasgow on a Saturday night, I'd be a bit nervous, right? Not because I think most Glaswegians want to beat me up, although that may be true. I don't know. If I walked around in an England shirt, OK, I'd be doubly nervous because I can't now I can't even keep my mouth shut. Right. And escape from possible, uh, you know, hostile activities. Right. Now, most white people would be a really good exercise to get most black people. Now, actually, it wouldn't be extremely dangerous. And annoying. But what I'm saying is that it's impossible to understand how that kind of thing feels because most, you know, most people. Again, I mean, equally, you know. Uh, as uh, you know, the, the female experience, most blokes, the majority of blokes, by the way, I think it's a high, you know, it's not an insignificant percentage are unpleasantly pervy in some way. OK, um, but again, if you're a woman in a city in a working life, you're going to encounter, you know, uh, you know, 2000 different people, which probably means you're almost sure to have a certain number of unpleasant encounters. And so quite often, I think. You know, we, the, the mistake has been made by saying that, uh, you know, you're all you're all guilty, horrible people and people react badly to that. Unsurprisingly, right. Older people who've probably made more progress in their life to being more tolerant and more easygoing, certainly less homophobic. I mean, I'll admit this. OK, um, it wouldn't have been unusual in 1988. OK, in the workplace to, to hear a homophobic joke. Right. No one would have got reported to HR. Now, we were working with people, you know, uh, uh, you know, they, they were, it's the advertising industry. There were, you know, not a minor number of, uh, of uh, you know, there were people in same sex relationships, uh, you know, in higher numbers than you would have found, say, in a manufacturing industry. But that wouldn't have been an unusual thing to do. And it's changed. OK, so older people probably feel, well, hold on, we made all these changes. Now suddenly 20 year olds are shouting at me like I'm a member of the clan or something. And so there are two things. There's the worthiness of the cause and there's the quality of the messaging. And what I generally find is the quality of the messaging that comes from people of colour is very high because it says, consider this experience, it's different. OK, whereas quite often the quality of the virtue signalling from white middle class people is actually quite poor. It's more likely to actually encourage hostility or pushback than it is to encourage you know, intelligent consideration. And the other thing is that, um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think these campaigns are really important and I think they're really valuable, by the way. But I think you've got to be alert to the fact that you can communicate for a worthy cause in a way that's counterproductive. That's the most important thing to consider. There's the brand question, which is, is this helping your brand? But there's also a secondary question, which is, if you understand the theory of reactance, which is people generally react badly to people being... <coughs> people bossing them around. I mean, quite literally, you know, if you start lecturing people on things, and lecturing people on language is a bit of a dubious one. You know, I've occasionally been told by an American that I'm using the wrong term for something. Now, if you look at American English, OK, you've got African-American. Well, what, what do you use? I've seen Americans struggle to describe someone of colour who isn't American because they get, you know, my colleague who is, as I said, Afro-Caribbean. You know, they went, uh, is Cordell the chap who's, um, and they, they were looking for the phrase and they realised they couldn't say, you know, African-American. And they were just in a total, total mind. These are Americans. Total mind mess. And I occasionally get told, no, no, you can't say that. You can't say Afro something. And I kind of go, Look, I, this is kind of our language. We're using it in England. You know, having Americans lecturing English people on what words to use, kind of a bit, you know, it's not going to play well, right? And so there are two separate things, which is the quality of the courts, which is usually pretty high, you know, um, for the most part. Um, but there's the quality of the actual argument, which in some cases, I think, signalling to what preaching to the choir actually loses you converts. That's, that's the point we've got to consider. And also it loses you customers conceivably because I think um, Stop Funding Hate's campaign against GB News um, probably backfired. A, because it made more people want to watch GB News because nothing makes you want to watch a channel like the idea that you're not supposed to be watching it. It's called the Barbara Streisand effect. And it happened because 
a, a Californian coastal erosion campaign filmed the whole California coastline and put it online so that people could study the erosion of the coast. And the footage of the coastal erosion captured images of Barbara Streisand's house. Okay. And Barbara Streisand got, went to court demanding that the footage of that stretch of the coast where her house featured must be removed from the uh, film that the coastal erosion people had put up on YouTube. Okay. Now, the hysterical thing is, before Barbara Streisand brought it to court, only five people had looked at her house, all of them experts in coastal erosion. The second she tried to stop people watching it, 200,000 people all went to the exact website and looked at the aerial photos of Barbara Streisand's house. So the whole thing completely misfired. And I think the whole thing misfired with GB News, because had they protested, by the way, after the channel had been up for three months, when they had some evidence of hatefulness, and to be honest, I've watched GB News. And to be honest, it's LBC with pictures. You know, it has a range of different opinions, some of them left wing, some of them more right wing than usual. I haven't really seen any evidence of something that a normal person would describe as hate. But Stop Funding Hate were trying to fund a to promote a boycott of the channel before the channel had even launched. Now, that discredits them, I think. And a lot of people were basically saying, you know, a lot of people were saying, hold on, if you as Ikea will stop advertising on a channel just because a small splinter group claims not to like the people who are funding the channel, we won't shop at Ikea. And it's worth remembering that even though news programmes don't get massive viewers, the Daily Mail has a hell of a lot more readers than Stop Funding Hate has members. So, you know, from a commercial standpoint, you've got to be a bit alert to this. Yes, they can make your life hell on social media. And yes, by the way, consumers have a complete right to boycott any product or service or brand for any reason they choose. That's how capitalism works. That's how we keep companies honest. OK, you're not obliged. You're not in procurement. You're not obliged to buy the cheapest product. You can use your for any reason you like. And if stop funding hate. Uh, get significant enough support to say we think this publication is hateful and enough of people will boycott the products that advertise in, in order to kill it okay that's a perfectly acceptable way to use consumer power I, i'm not opposed to what top funding stop funding hate purports to do but i thought the fact that they wanted to defund a news channel before it had even launched completely discredited their cause you know Thank you, Rory. That's, I mean, so there was, a, there was a comment up there from Tom, which said it was one of the most uh, brilliantly articulated uh, discussions on brand purpose that he's ever seen. So thank you for... Oh, brilliant. Oh, I didn't expect that. <laughs> and uh, so you have a meeting to go to as well. So, so uh, we should release you, but I'd absolutely love a follow-up session. So we'd love to make that happen if possible. Um, Anytime. The other but, thing I'm interested in is... For, for marketers in smaller companies, I'm really interested in Ogilvy Consulting doing a kind of Telly McKinsey. Okay. Which is, if you have companies in the same field, which either overlap or are non-competitive, why charge McKinsey prices, or we can't anyway, but charge half McKinsey prices and talk to one person at a time, when you could arguably charge 1% of McKinsey prices and talk to 100 people at a time? Sure. So... The extent to which, if, if, if you're in a business like the cafe business or the, and, you know, maybe go to your trade body or whoever it is. So one, one, one thing I have thought of doing is targeting trade bodies for small businesses and saying, you know, this trick with the chairs, with cafes, okay, that could actually, you know, you know, we're looking at a project with the IPA for how we recruit people into the hospitality industry. Because the hospitality industry is actually a mini MBA. I think working in the hospitality industry is actually brilliant. And yet it's become demeaned with phrases like McJobs, which is completely unfair. Uh, and so, you know, and so um, uh, the, the really interesting question there is, you know, are there other interesting ways in which we can work together where you can create kind of collective consulting over Zoom? Absolutely. Which well. could deliver a huge amount of value to a large number of small businesses you know, in a reasonably efficient use of time. I'd love to explore that. I mean, so certainly, you know, we've got a bunch of folks within the community uh, mm. representing all kinds of companies, but no doubt overlapping as well. Uh, it'll be really, really interesting uh, to, to explore. It might that. be really interesting, it, it, it actually, where you have people who run hospitality outlets and people who run something completely different like distribution and actually to actually have joint meetings where they share their findings. Because quite often there are solutions which are obvious in one domain but nobody's thought of them in another domain. 
for sure. I love it. Well, there's there's a, there's a bunch of comments coming in here. One from Charlotte saying, I'm, I'm up for it. Maria's up for it. Philip is up for it. So we, we've got <laughs> we've got people. So uh, let's explore it. Yeah. Let's have a thought. That'd be fantastic. Thanks ever so much. Lovely. Thank you for taking time. And thank you, everyone. For Always that. a pleasure. Thank you, everybody.